hit the record button and say, um, welcome. Uh, we were chit-chatting before this, but w welcome back to Michelle from Mahjong Central. Um, she's uh, helped me get through a lot of COVID, learning a lot. Uh, my friend Kathy, I know, is also a big fan. She's like, she's actually, <laughs> you taught her the game. Nice. Um, so I, I'm going to let her take it away. This, this one is strategy by wall. So if anybody wants to um, have a question, I will monitor the chat, or if you want to, um, I have muted everybody. If you want to unmute yourselves, if you have a timely question and you want to ask, um, I know Michelle's uh, got this broken down and she's more than capable of taking it away. So here we go, Michelle. <laughs> Thank you, Linda. Thank you so much for having me. Nice to meet you all if we haven't met in the last uh, episode, but uh, I will have a question for you to start with. How by let's do a um, hashtag sloper in chat if you know who Tom Sloper is. Hashtag sloper in chat. Anybody know who Tom Sloper is? Oh my goodness, you don't know. All right, well, Tom Sloper is a Mahjong aficionado. He is probably one of the, um, the top community leaders for Mahjong players. And he, I don't know how long he's been playing Mahjong. I probably should look on his website, but he has a, an online, uh, I'm gonna call it a library. It's like an, it's not a library where you check out books, but he's got all kinds of information on his website about Mahjong. And it's not just American Mahjong. It, it goes even back to, um, early, early origins of the game. So there's history, the art of the game, different versions, and a lot about American Mahjong on that site. So when I, I started playing uh, American Mahjong in 1990, and when I was learning, I, I learned other ways to play the game, but while I was learning this particular version, I found his website, and he has a lot of letters and bulletins where he talks about rules and strategies and things like that. And years ago, I found a strategy that he adopted from chess. Do any of you play chess? Just do a raise of hands if you play chess. Nobody plays chess? Okay, I, I don't either. But there's a strategy called, um, it, it's a strategy through the phases of the game. And he used that concept and applied it to Mahjong, where the strategies are based on the wall in play. So I'm going to, at this point, go to my presentation. So, um, and we'll, we'll hopefully go through the presentation part quickly because I want to then do a demonstration at Mahjong time where we apply the, the strategies in a game with robots. So I am going to share my screen or attempt to here. Okay. All good, we can see it. Okay. All right, so here's the presentation and uh, we'll just go through this quickly. And if you have any questions along the way, either put up your hand or say something in chat and we'll pause. So here's a, a game that is set up. Four, four walls of tiles. These are tiles, the yellow bits are tiles. And the key with this strategy it's actually a whole bunch of strategies in one packaged in one strategy called strategy by wall and the the key to this strategy is timing because it's based on the wall in play so when you when you first set up your wall you push your you know east pushers out their wall and in this case we're we, in this example we didn't roll the dice we're just pushing out a whole wall so for for purposes of the training we're not going to do a broken wall so in in the first part of the game it's called the begin game where we're going to deal the tiles and after you deal the tiles you're left with a short wall and then a full third wall and a full fourth wall. So the begin game is during the Charleston and that very first short wall. And that's the begin game. And these are the strategies in the begin game. 
And now some of this is going to be fundamental probably to, to many of you. So bear with me as we go through some of these fundamentals. We'll get, it'll get more and more complex as we go. So the first thing you're going to do is arrange your tiles. Then you're going to do what I call building around multiples. If you don't have multiples, which would be pair Pung Kong, then you build around the predominant pattern. And that pattern would be a category on the card. So you're going to build around the strength of your hand, whatever that strength is. Then, oops, where did my, there. Then you're going to identify your first three discards for passing. And interestingly, you really, some people might try to continue that analysis, but once I have three tiles that I know I don't need, I stop the analysis. I don't even go further because whatever tiles I'm getting could totally change my plans. So once I get my three tiles, I stop the analysis. So then when you're passing, this is something that you have to think about and not everybody does, but for, and I think this goes to a style of play uh, depending on what what kind of player you are, some I don't know if you've you've uh, noticed during a game, but some players are very uh, relaxed in the tiles they pass. You know, passing flowers, pears. I one time I got a pair of wins and a wind, so I played a wind hand. <laughs> so some people will not pay too much attention on what they pass. All they're focused on is their hand. In my opinion, if you have strategy in your passing, you're going to mitigate risk with those tiles going to your opponents. So it's something to think about. So I'm going to go through a list of best case, I'm sorry, this is, um, this is best case scenario to worst case scenario with the tiles you're passing. So the best kind of pass would be a single wind or dragon with a different number and different suits. That is the best pass you can do. Next would be a different number tile from each suit. So even though they're all number tiles, if they're different suits, that's a good thing. Then same category. Now, some of these categories are less, um, um, Less, less played, like three, six, nine. If I, I would be okay passing three, six, nine, because that's kind of a tough category. You've got to have a really good representation in that category because there's only three numbers. So three, six, nine, if you pass all three, six, nine tiles, it's not as uh, risky as passing, for example, uh, all odds. That's just a little example. Then after that, the same suit when you pass all dots or all cracks, something like that, or all, all dragons or all winds for that matter. Then white dragons and flowers. And a lot of people don't really understand my fixation on white dragons. And some people share the strategy, some don't. And all this is subjective. You pick and choose what, what works for you. But this is what I have found, that white dragons in particular are very risky because there's only four of them. They're used in year tiles and they're a dual tile. So you can use white dragons as dragons and as year tiles. And usually, at least this time in our on our calendar, zeros are going to be in the big year in the year hand, including the biggest hand on the card. So I will very rarely pass white dragons and flowers in the Charleston. And we'll talk more about that later. And then finally, like numbers or pairs. That's last resort. For example, if if I'm playing a pair hand and I and I am, let's say I have two discards and they're uh, like numbers. I might pass like numbers in that case if I'm very close to a winning hand because I know I'm going to probably be able to complete my hand before anybody gets ready with those tiles. So the game is very situational and these, as I was saying before, are very subjective. You've got to um, take a lot of things into consideration as far as what's being passed, what you're seeing exposed and discarded later in the game, and then the decisions that you make based on those variables will uh, affect whatever strategy you decide to apply. But these are the strategies for the begin game. Uh, and I just think like numbers is almost as risky as passing a pair. 
because there are like numbers all over the card every year. Okay, so one of the keys about the Charleston is that you reassess after every pass, especially if you form a new multiple. If a new multiple forms, put everything in order so you can get a good lay of the land and see if you can leverage that new multiple because American Mahjong is a game of multiples. Um, some of the analysis that I've done on the card is that about 80% of the hands on the card are pair, uh, pung, sorry, pung, um, kong, big multiples, pair, pung, kong, multiples. It's a game of multiples. Only like 10%, 10, 12% are singles and pairs, just that one category. And there's a smattering of single tile hands, but not very many. So really this is a game of multiples. And that's one reason why you don't wanna pass pairs in the Charleston. Then finally, this one, play at the category level until you have no discards. So you don't need to pick a hand. You don't need to pick a hand until you've run out of discards. When you run out of discards, that's when you drill down into the category and start whittling out some of the options. And that way you can release tiles for passing and still not commit to a hand too early on because you could paint yourself into a corner. So I think that is it for these. Oh, uh, when to pass blind and when to stop the Charleston. These are things that we're going to talk about um, in a few minutes. So let's pause this presentation. Does anybody have any questions yet? And feel free to unmute yourselves or put it in the chat. Okay, so we're gonna play a game with robots here and we're gonna go through the Charleston and we're gonna talk about some of these strategies that we just shared. So this is Mahjong time. This is where I like to play I think it's the, the best way to, where, uh, place to play. Okay, so. Sure, no, we, we're still sh seeing the share screen of your oh, uh, slide. Oh, okay, thank you. Yeah, I forget I have to sh stop sharing and share again. Thank you. Here we go. All right, so now, can you see Mahjong time? Yes. Okay. <laughs> okay, so here, here are the tiles. So the first thing you do is you look for multiples because that is where your strength is going to be. Whatever multiples you have, you build around those. So that's where you start. And in this case, we have a pair of flowers. The thing about flowers, there, there are flowers in every category. So I tend to just kind of put those off to the side. And at this point, look for multiples in the number tiles, winds and dragons. But we have all singles. So that means that we look for the predominant pattern. And does anybody see a predominant pattern? Shout it out if you see a predominant pattern here. Go ahead. What is it, Kathy? You got. You want to unmute yourself or write it in the chat. Oh, we can't hear. The mute button's on the bottom. Just click on, on your screen if you click on the- Six, seven, eight, nine. Yep, consecutive run. So for, for this hand, that's the predominant pattern. We're gonna gather big numbers. So that means that all the little numbers can go. So I'm gonna pass a one, a two, and a wind. Maybe, yeah, a one, two wind, because I wanna break up these winds. I don't wanna pass two winds together unless I have to. That's a step down from like numbers. But winds are not to, at played as often as hands with number tiles. So one wind at a time is good. Two wins at a time is a bit risky. So we're going to exchange tiles. Let's see what we get. We're going to build around six, seven, eight, nine, four numbers in a range. And we got a keeper, a six. It's in our range of four, a four number range, which is ideal. There's only one hand that spans five numbers on the 2020 card. And it's the very first hand on the card uh, of that category, one through five or five through nine. All the others are between two, is it two and three or three and four, three and four numbers in a range. Oh, I'm sorry, there's one more. The um, fifth hand down. The fifth hand down is five numbers. But if, so for consecutive run, if you focus on four numbers in a range, that's a really good um, sort of, uh, uh, 
strategy because most of the hands in that category are going to be four numbers in a range. So we have six, seven, eight, nine, that's four numbers. And now we can pass tiles. And here, instead of passing two, four, and one suit, I'm going to pass a, a green dragon. So we'll do a wind, a dragon, and a number. And this is one of the best kind of passes you could do. It could be a little better if that four were off suit from the dragon, like a crack or a dot. So it's a little bit risky because the four and the green dragon correspond. So we'll pass those. Let's see if we can get a multiple in here. Six, seven, eight, nine is what we're looking for. So we got a nine. And we did get a five, but in mixed suits in this arrangement, that is not helpful. Five, a five number range, we're not gonna be able to use all those tiles in mixed suits. So, if, and, and we're left with a, like numbers with twos and a white dragon. If we were to pass two twos and a white dragon, I think someone at the table might fall out of their chair if we were in a live game. So what I would do here is whittle this down. So we didn't pick a hand yet. Now we have risky discards for this pass. We're gonna have to pick, pick a hand or at least whittle down to free up some of our discards. So I would pass one of these and probably we have six through nine, four number range. We're just gonna have to pick one. I think the five can go. Uh, let's see, we have no multiples. Uh, six, seven, eight, nine. We just have to, I think it's going to be arbitrary at this point. And really, we could pass a white dragon, but passing a two with a, with a white dragon in 2020 would be very risky. So what I would probably do here is I would probably let go of a six or a nine, one or the other. So let's pass the six crack. Because if we passed a six bam, we'd pass five, six, and one suit. So five, six, and uh, two suits is a little, that that's, mitigates the risk a little bit. So let's see if we can get some big numbers in here. Oh, I just realized something. I should have kept that five bam because yeah. we could have played the six hand down. That's all right. We, we picked up some multiples. Now we have our first multiples, six, seven, eight, nine. Six, seven, eight, nine. So we, we have a... A way to go now. So we're going to say yes for the Charleston. If you have discards, clearly you're going to continue going. So in this case, we're not going to really talk about stopping the Charleston at, at right now. So now we are going to pass and we're going to focus on BAMs because that's where our multiples are. So we're building around the multiples, six, seven, six, seven, eight, likely second hand down looks pretty good to me unless we get that five BAM back. So I think what I would do here is pass an even with two odds. This is a little bit risky. If we were to pass maybe three white seven, that might be a safer pass. But I, again, just really don't like to pass white dragons. So we're going to keep it. This is what I would do in a live game. So we're going to keep that white dragon for a bit. Michelle, is your attitude going to change about the white dragon when we go to 2021? Uh, maybe just a little. Right now, since there's two white dragons in the year tile, the risk of passing a white dragon will lessen with the, with the 2021 card because there's only one white dragon. But there's always the big year hand on the card. And what I'm thinking they're going to do, I'm predicting, uh, 2021 in three suits is what I'm predicting for the, the big year hand. So that's three white dragons in the big year hand. And if you pass a white dragon and someone's playing that hand, you're going to put a smile on their face. So, yeah, I, I think I still probably wouldn't pass white dragons um, unless I had to. So now we've got some tiles to pass. We don't need any of these tiles here, so I would pass those. I'm still hoping we'll get that five bam back. We got it. So now we have a little flexibility. We can play five, six, seven, eight, or six, seven, eight, nine, or six, seven, eight, second hand down, or, or six hand down. And this is a, is a nice pass. Now this is two, four, six, all evens, but different suits. And really, it's going to have the same risk. Two, four, five, which is more consecutive, 
but it's all one, one of each suit or two, four, six, all evens. Either way, you're gonna have some level of risk. Okay, we got a keeper. We got two. Look at that. Five, six, seven, eight, nine. So we have five, six, seven, eight. Gosh, it'd be nice if we could get that green dragon back because maybe we could play a pair hand. You know what I would do here? I would pass two and see if we could maybe play that pair hand and get a green dragon. What do you guys think? Is that what you would do with this hand? Raise your hand if you'd go for a pair hand here. Okay, we got a few hands. All right, so we're gonna pass two. Let's see, maybe we'll get the green dragon. No. All right, so we ended up with three discards and a potential pair hand. And that I think is due to building around multiples. Well, we started out building around the predominant pattern. Of course, it, our plan included the pair of flowers, which gave us a heads up or a leg up, I guess you could say. So we picked the predominant pattern to go with those flowers. Then we built up multiples and we focused on the multiples. We gathered tiles around those multiples and we have three discards for a potential pair hand. I would call that a great success. When, when I'm playing, my goal is to have four discards or less after the Charleston. If I have more than four discards, I consider myself to be an underdog for that game. If I have less than four, I, I'd say I, I have a pretty good chance of winning that game. So we are going to, now if you look here at the wall, we this game rolls the dice so you can see that the east has a short wall so you kind of have to visualize a, a wall here so if those tiles here on the right were in front of me instead of over there i'd say it would come to about right here so that is about three quarters of a wall so we're we're in the begin game and we're going to play until we get to these tiles here and we're left with one full wall and then a fourth wall and then we're going to talk about the middle game. So this is the begin game. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm east. Um, okay, so we're gonna discard the white dragon. White dragon. And we're just gonna get through this little short wall here. Four bamboo. We dealt through these tiles here, that's why. I thought that was One east, bamboo. but we're east. Okay, so I'd say we're probably playing a pair hand or maybe the sixth hand down under consecutive Two bamboos. run. bamboos. If we can get a, a green dragon, that would be good. Now, as far as discarding, since we're probably playing a pair hand here, I wouldn't think so much about jokers and would just discard what's going down. In this case, we're in the early game, so you really don't know. So what I Nine do characters. right now is I discard the tiles from the outside in, like one, two, three, and seven, eight, nine. And that's because numbers four through five are more likely going to be used in exposures with jokers. Four characters. So that's a, a theory that many of us are oh. working on. So there's a four, four, four five, six, and there's a joker. That's why I like to discard one, two, three, or seven, two eight, characters. nine. So let's just watch hmm. and see what happens. So we have a, a pung of twos now, nine pung of fours characters. with a joker. We have two discards. We have one more pick for this wall. Three bamboos. And this again is the begin game. Five I'm sorry, Michelle. I don't see how one of them is a joker that's on the on the down. That it's, one, it's, 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 it's this color. Four, the four crack on the end is a little bit lighter in color. That's a joker. Bamboos. Okay, that's, right. just not familiar with the game. Okay. Yep, yep. It's a joker. It's a little. It's kind of like ghostly. It's like a whiter color. Okay. Now we could potentially take that tile for a pung for that six hand down. But I still think we could hold on to this idea of a pair hand. I would let it go. Okay, so now I'll throw the nine dot. Nine now dots. we're gonna pause because now we're going into Six the middle dots. game. Once it gets to my turn, we're gonna pause Five and bandits. we're gonna look at the strategies for the strategies during One the middle dot. game, which is which is right now. Cause we're now in, well, actually one more pick cause we have you see the short wall over here? We have a, a few more picks because there are tiles in that very last wall. So let's keep two going. Dots. Let's do two more picks and then we'll talk about the middle game. 
So we're still right, technically right in the in the begin game because there's a short Two wall dots. over here. And that's where you have to kind of visualize a, a full wall with that little wall over there. Okay, we got a potential keeper there. I'm thinking what Three I would dots. probably do is play single pair Pong Kong now. That six hand down. One character. And I would sacrifice the pair of six bams and start discarding those. Four bamboos. But we could pung that eight and Kong the nine. If we get a flower, we Six could potentially bamboos. even have a pure hand. Now that would be our single tile if we play that six hand down. So I would not take that. And we'd only be able to play um, that with a, a Kong anyway in this particular situation. Okay, so now we're gonna go back to this presentation because this is where we are. We're on the in the middle game now. So I'm going to uh, open this up so we can have a bigger, a little bit bigger of a screen. We're gonna go to the middle game. So bear with me as we get there. Okay, so here we go, middle game. How many of you, I, I only see- We're, if you we're keep, still on the Mahjong Central screen. You gotta flip your oh, screen Oh, shoot. Yeah. I know, it's a lot. Sure. <laughs> Juggling here, okay. Um, now, can everybody see my screen now? Middle game, objectives? Yep. Okay, yep. so these are, now that we're in the middle game, there are new uh, new strategies and different nuances that come into the game at this point. What everyone is doing right now is they're building their hand from, you know, their randomly dealt tiles, they're, they're building right now. So it, it'll be rare that people will mahjong in the early stages of the middle game. So people are building. And there's a strategy called joker bait. I don't know if any of you've heard this strategy, but the idea is that you hold on to pairs that you know you don't need. And then late in the middle game, towards the end of the third wall, which is where we are, we're, we're in the beginning of the third wall, but towards the end of the third wall, you want to get discard, be, be sure to discard some of that joker bait because in that stage of the game, people will be claiming discards and making exposures with a joker. And if you discard one of your pair tiles, somebody makes an exposure with that joker and on your next turn, you take that second tile and make an exchange and get the joker. This is kind of a hit or miss strategy, but this is when, uh, this is the timing for when that particular strategy works well. So the other one is stay concealed as long as you can. So do you remember when that six bam went down? We had five through nine, they were mostly pairs. That six bam, we could have punged, but we didn't have any bigger multiples and we were maybe playing a pair hand. So I did not take it. And we still have flexibility now. We built up that nine bam, so we have a pung now. And if I had taken that six bam, I would have locked myself in. So now we have flexibility and now we have a pung that we're gonna be able to leverage with pairs. So you wanna stay concealed as long as you can. Keep tiles that have not been discarded or exposed. And this is really gonna depend on your style of play. My partner, my business partner, she disagrees with this strategy. She likes to discard tiles that have not been discarded because if they're not being discarded, they're being held or they're in the wall. So if she draws a tile that has not been discarded, she wants to get rid of it and try to sabotage somebody else's hand. That's one way to look at it. Another way to look at it is to keep those tiles because maybe someone will make an exposure with a joker and you'll have one in your hand to make an exchange. So it's kind of like a strategy on two sides of a coin. Next, reassess any time a multiple forms. When we were playing that hand, we were thinking about a pair hand and then we drew a nine bam and have a pung now. So you just wanna reassess because we have a pung that weighs heavier and we, had, we have two singles in there, five bam, six bam, but no green dragon, that's a gap. Anytime you have a gap, you wanna lower that particular option and go with the hand that does not have a gap, which for us at this time is that six hand down single pair Pung Kong, six through nine. And really that came in when that multiple formed. Okay, next, do not claim a discard until you're ready to commit to a hand. This I find really interesting when some, someone has a, a Pung and someone discards that tile and they Kong just because they can. 
and then they build around that calm. I think that could be painting yourself into a corner if you don't have the tiles currently in your hand around that calm, because then you're going to be scampering to try to support tile, you know, get supporting tiles for that con that you committed to because it's a pure con, but really it's about the whole makeup of your hand, not just one exposure. You got to be able to use the most of the tiles you have to leverage the strength of your hand instead of just trying to find strength and then regroup because of that pure con. So try to, tr don't claim a discard until you're ready to commit to a particular hand. Confirm a hand is not concealed before you claim a discard. So if you're thinking about a, a discard, just double check that X or C. And that's really important when the new card comes out because we're not used to what hands are concealed and what hands are exposable, especially when the league puts concealed hands in the middle of a category. Okay, next, what, watch what others are playing and discarding and exposing to try to figure out what category they're playing and then adjust your strategy. And where this is helpful is if, let's say, our opponent on our left had a pung of two cracks, the opponent on our right had a pung of four cracks. If we were in between cracks and bams, I'd probably start getting rid of my cracks and focus on bams because they're, they both have exposures and cracks. So that would be an example of this concept. Next, commit to one category towards the end of the second wall, which is where we are. We're just going into the middle game, which is the third wall. And we have our category. We're playing consecutive run. So when, when you're in the begin game, you're gathering, you're building around strength, you're not picking a hand yet, you're just at the category level. Sometimes you might be in two categories, but when you get to that, that third wall, you want to try to commit to a category because not, not only do you want to, um, you know, focus your energy on the goal, but your opponents are doing that too. So you want to kind of expedite the decision making by whittling down to one category going into the third wall. Next, commit to a single hand towards the end of the third wall if you can. Because going into the end game, the fourth wall, that's when people are going to start being ready to win, if not before. So the third wall is building and whittling down, whittling down finally to whatever hand it is you're going to play. So I think that's the last one here. Oh, wait, there's one more. Rede redeem jokers from another player's hand to prevent someone else from benefiting. So this one, you want to still leave a joker exposed, though, because you don't want to potentially make their hand jokerless. If they have one exposure with a joker, I think that's OK. But if they have two exposures and both have a joker, you don't want to exchange both jokers because you could be making their hand pure. You want to leave one joker exposed. Um, otherwise, you could end up paying double for that hand. And then lastly, discard fresh tiles by the end of the third wall. So we're going to talk about that as we go. But the idea is that you don't want to be left with risky discards in your hand going into the fourth wall. So let's go back to the game now. And we're going to play it out. All right, so we're in the third wall. Now we have to visualize this short wall here. So if we take that little short wall, I would say right about here is the last wall, right here, starting right above that two dot. So these are all the tiles in the middle game. So while we're picking from the middle game, from this wall, the third wall, the, all those strategies we talked about, we need to focus on. And right around in here, if we have joker bait, that's where we want to start getting rid of it. And we also want to start discarding any fresh tiles. We want to switch the idea of holding tiles that are safe for the end game. So right now, we're going to focus on the middle game strategies. We'll discard this white dragon. Michelle, I, I just have a quick question. I have a, sure. I have a friend who likes to play the last wall is the Mahjong wall. You can only pick it up from Mahjong. Bamboo. So in that case, you would shift around, I think, what your end wall would be, correct? Oh, God. Okay, so um, it, it, let me, ooh. Sorry, okay, what we got? You, you play. <laughs> we'll okay, well, later. that's okay. 
Um, so we build up another multiple, but if I had jokers, I would switch to a quint here, but we don't have any jokers. This, this looks really nice for that fourth quint. Uh, quint, pair, pair, quint, six, seven, eight, nine, but we have no jokers. Um, so in regards to the question, correct me if I'm wrong, is she, you're talking about a uh, hot wall where are you talking about hot wall where the last wall you can only win by by picking it yourself? No. Um, well, the last wall that she has, you can only pick up a discard if it's for your mahjong. Okay, that's called okay. that's uh, called hook a mahjong. No, no, no. Wall. no, no. Um, that's that, a hot wall. Hot that wall. is a hot yeah. wall. And where does everybody um, does um, the player who discarded that tile pay for the table? Do you know? No. Oh, okay. Not unless it, no. Okay. So, um, the because, yeah, the Mahjong person could have an exposed, uh, you know, a concealed hand or, well, whatever. But I'm just saying your strategy then would kind of move, right? You would kind of then ignore the hot wall and move your strategy into the, the second to last wall. Well, I first, personally, I wouldn't play in a hot wall game. Because uh, that would be a house rule, and it's not really condoned by the league per se. But but um, if somebody is playing hot wall, where you can only win by drawing it yourself. Oh no no no! You're saying you can only win by discard. I mean, that you can only pick up the discard if it's for your mahjong. You can't okay. pick up a discard for exposure unless it's for your mahjong exposure. That's called cold wall. Okay. Cold wall. So in this is in your handout. It's um, on page tw 13. So hot wall is where the wall in the wall that remains in front of the dealer, that short little wall. Um, if a player wins from a tile discarded during that wall, the discarding player has to pay for everybody. That's hot wall. Cold wall is when you can only win by self pick. So players can discard risky tiles and there's no penalty. So that, that would be cold wall. Okay, so now um, here we go. We have a, a discard here. So here Since we that. have six, seven, eight, nine. I'm thinking single pair, Pung Kong. Sing wait, I think wait. this five band probably can go. We still don't have the green dragon. So this pair hand, I probably wouldn't consider. Um, I, I'm thinking nine six, characters. seven, eight, or seven, eight, nine. Oh yeah, look, we got a flower. We need that because we need four flowers for for either hand. I would say either the second hand down we could play or this or the sixth hand down. So here we can discard this uh, five bam. Five bamboos. And I would say, let's see, uh, how many are there? Any eight bams out? I don't see any eight bams. Seven dots. So probably what I would do. Well, we'll see what we what we get. One but dot. I would probably play. The second hand down here. Three bamboos. And it's just going to be a matter of whatever comes next. Five dots. And so we're going to have a, a, a hefty pung to let go of probably. The other Four option characters. would be instead of discarding a, a pung would be to discard a pair Green and play single pair pung kong. Okay now there's a joker. So I think that's what I would do here. I would leverage these multiples and discard the six bam. So now our Thanks hand is bamboo. set with that joker because we have single pair pung potential kong. Either Four either bamboo. way, we could pung the eight and kong the nine or use this joker for the flower. Seven dots. So six hand down. We were in between the second hand down, the six hand down, and I think either one Seven would dots. be viable. Oh, and then we get the five. We already discarded it and we're set already. Five now, if you if you don't know the, the term set, there are really two definitions, but the definition I use is Nine if dots. you can claim a discard for every block in your two hand, dots. whatever hand you're playing, that's called being set. You're ready to go on every part of your hand. Some people call being set Red when you're win. ready to mahjong, but I call that 
ready to mahjong. So being set means you can claim a discard for each block in your hand, and then ready to win is when you're waiting for Sound one me. tile. So in this case, we're set because we can Kong the flower, Pung the eight, and Kong the nine. We're just waiting for the right tiles. Five dot. Now we are, we're going into the end game now. Do you see this short wall right around Seven this two dot? dot? That's where the, the fourth wall is, end game. Four dot. So we have maybe two more picks for the middle game still. And we have one discard and incidentally we discarded it and, and nobody again. wanted it. So it is likely a safe tile. We got a keeper. We'll discard that. And now we're ready to win on um, a flower or a nine bam. And we're just now we're just now finishing the end game, ready to win. Five or characters. we're finishing the middle game, sorry. Pump. Okay. Green dragon. So now we have two jokers visible here. Five characters. We need a, a flower or a Five nine bam. Five characters. And what's what's going to be interesting if we draw a nine bam or Two a flower, bamboos. we'll we'll be able to declare mahjong, but we Come could on. even consider pushing a, pushing a pure hand. Nine discard dot. the joker and try to play jokerless. If I were playing in a tournament, I probably wouldn't do that. If I self-picked a win, I'd probably just declare Red mahjong. Dragon. But it is a way to get some score. Discard Four that joker dots. and go for pure. That would double the value of your hand. It's a little Most risky win. though. Three characters. We ended up getting those green, green dragons dragon. for that potential pair hand. Green dragon. So we're in we're in the end game. Let's go look at those strategies real quick, right? When, when, we, get, when we get this next pick, we'll pause for a second because the strategies in the end game change. Three dots. So we'll get our, our pick next. We got Mahjong. All right, so we'll just go ahead and Mahjong here. And let's go look at the end game strategies for... Um, for the end game. We didn't get there. We'll we'll do another game so that we can look at the strategies for the end game. Okay. All right, now, so end game. We're in the last wall. Um, and that that was a short wall over there. And of course, we won that game, so it ended. But these are the strategies for the end game. So in the end game, you have to decide whether you're gonna play to win or switch to defense. And a rule of thumb that I use is four tiles. If I am four tiles from winning at the end of the third wall, I'll play to win. If I have more than four tiles, four discards, I may switch to defense and try to I break up my hand so as not to discard into a winning hand because you you have just that last wall to go with four discards and you have to think in those groups of four because there are four people at the table every group of four is one turn if you have four discards that means that that's a pretty significant that's like half the wall almost maybe maybe more like a third of the wall. So you just have to think about how many discards you have versus how many tiles are left in the wall to see what your chances are of winning that hand. And you also have to consider the tiles that are out, the tiles that are discarded, the tiles that are exposed, because if with your discards that are remaining, you got to think about what are the chances of you getting the tiles that you need. And if your tiles are out there, you may need jokers, which may or may not be already committed. So it's something to think about. Four, four tiles is kind of the guideline that I use. Here too is where you wanna triage those discards. You wanna keep the safest discard in the end game in your hand because the further you get into that last wall, the closer people are to a winning hand. So you wanna get rid of your riskiest discards if you're playing to win as soon as possible so that you can hold the safer discards for later in the game. Risky tiles should go first if you're playing to win. 
If you're playing defense, then you can start discarding tiles that you know are safe. Do not claim discards for an exposure if you are play, playing defense. There's no reason for you to claim a discard if you're put playing defense. All you're going to do at that point is give away information about the tiles that are no longer going to be available to those players. So let's say somebody's playing um, a hand where they need a pung of fours and I decided to switch to defense and someone threw a uh, four and I put out a Kong uh, with a joker, then they'll know, okay, I, I'm not going to be able to use those fours. I'm going to have to switch my hand a little bit because of that exposure. If I were playing defense, I would hold those because that's information that I can keep from that player by staying concealed or keeping those tiles concealed. So if you're playing defense, do not make any exposures, just hoard those tiles. Discard tiles that have been exposed or discarded. Discard number tiles that where there are three or more out, but consider a few things here. Year tiles, wins, and singles. On this card, every number tile had a, has a hand where there's a single tile. So no tile was safe on this card. And then you have to think about year, the year hand. So right now, twos and white dragons are very risky to discard in the end game. If uh, in 2021, ones and white dragons are gonna be very, very risky to discard in the end game because of the year hand. And then also you have to think about news. If there's news on the card, single news, if you throw a single wind, you could be, for example, feeding into that very last hand on the card where there's news. So really there's no, there's no safe single tile on the 2020 card anyway. So you just wanna try to look at what is out and make a decision based on what's out. Also, you can discard a joker because nobody can pick up a joker. All right, that's it. That concludes the strategy by wall. It's a lot, I know. Um, let me sh stop sharing here. So again, the idea is timing. You base your strategies on the wall in play. In the begin game, you're, you're getting your, your tiles built around that strength of the hand. In the middle game, you're building your hand, focusing on the strength of the hand. And then towards the end game, that end of the middle wall, and then towards that last wall, that's when you decide, am I playing to win or am I going to switch to defense based on what is out and how many discards I have? So different strategies, different wall, and that can set you up for success. So now I've muted people. If people want to unmute themselves, if they have a question or if they want to put something in the chat, um, Does about anybody have any covered? questions? Now, I, I did send that presentation um, by email. So if anybody wants it, um, you're free to have access to that presentation. I, 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 will, I will, to this group, I will, so came out, I will follow up. She did, she, she sent us the, uh, like you said, the, the presentation, I'll, I'll send it out afterwards. Yeah, we could probably, yes. Okay, so say uh, when you were playing and you were contemplating doing singles and pairs mm -hmm. and you were lining everything up, what would you have done if you picked, if you got a joker? Would you throw the joker out, hold it, or look at switching? Okay, so at the, at the po point when we had all those pairs, all, the, yes. all those pa multiples were pairs, we had a gap. We had no green dragon. If I drew a joker and I have a gap in a with a pair hand, I'd keep the joker and I would switch out of that category and leverage that joker. If I did not have a gap, if I had a green dragon and one discard plus the joker, I would throw the joker because we're one pick away from a ready hand uh, and a pair hand at that. But that joker, this is where you got to have a, you know, you've got to kind of uh, look at all the variables. So if you're in where we were, we had a pair of flowers, a single five bam, and then we had pairs six through nine, and then two discards, I believe. 
no green dragons. That was the kicker. And then when that nine bam came in, we had a pung then and a gap, no green dragon. So we switched out of the singles and pairs category because of the gap. And that same strategy would apply to if that nine bam had been a joker, because okay. then we could use that joker as one of the bigger multiples in the hand because we had a gap with no green dragon. So really it's more about the gap hand. If you're playing a hand with a gap, go for something where there's no gap. That's better than trying to play a hand where you got a big gap because then you're committing, you could be painting yourself into a corner again because you have a gap. If you're playing that pair hand and then someone puts out a pung with a joker and your dragons, well, then you've got to switch. It also says a lot when you throw out a joker because it's saying mm -hmm. I'm only going for a, a pair or a single at that point. Yes, true. Now, the one of the reasons why I don't um, fret about that is if I'm playing a concealed hand because unless they're analyzing my discards and remembering everything I discarded, they're not going to know what I'm playing. Uh, and I could be playing a pair hand, but it, it could be one of seven hands. I don't think they're going to figure it out. And it could be any tile at that point. They don't know. So I don't mind so much throwing out a joker. Now, if I had exposures and I threw out a joker, I might not throw out the joker and break up my multiples and keep the joker and throw out a natural tile to not spook the table. So I could get my single or pair, whatever it is I'm waiting on. Okay. Any other questions? All right. Well, I hope you found strategy by well helpful. It, it, there are a lot of strategies in there. So if you if you play online, what you could do is look at you know play a game and during the the phases of the game by wall have that handout and just kind of study those strategies while you're in that wall and then when you go into the next wall look at the new list of strategies and that's a way that you can apply some of these concepts with strategy by wall it's all about timing and situational awareness is a key also because you've got to look at what is being discarded and what is in exposures because that can affect those, some of those strategies. Okay, well, thank you very much, Michelle. You're uh, welcome. You know, I always learn, I always learn a lot and uh, I'm gonna have to now go out and practice. I do wanna tell anybody that has come late, Michelle is gonna come back for, with us on Thursday, May 6th. That's gonna be a 7 p.m. program where she's going to go through the new card. So hopefully everybody's already, because last time you explained to us about when you get your timing of your card, hopefully everybody has ordered their card by the end of, I think it was February, so that yeah. they'll have the new card um, sometime in April. Mm -hmm. And then we'll start, uh, give Michelle a moment or two to analyze it. Maybe we ourselves will get a little familiar with it and then kind of come back and, and really dive into uh, the new card, because I'm ready for the 2020 card to be done. I don't know how everybody else feels, but I'm, I've, I'm kind of over it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, this this is kind of the phase of the, the life cycle of the American Mahjong card where we all get a little apathetic. We're, we're ready for something fresh. Unless I do know some people try to do every single card. I got my last hand last week. <laughs> do you guys got your card? Congratulations. Uh, so what did you, you take off all of your yeah I, I i mark it with a sharpie so i have a my sharpie right here at my desk and anytime i win a hand i put a little dot by it and uh i squeaked through this year because i i only played online i only played maybe once once a week online yeah, all, all year tournaments weren't really happening as long, yeah you didn't get a lot in the deck yeah let's hope that we can all get back to playing in person soon soon enough yep all right, well, thank you everyone for coming.